Hello. I'm excited to continue our conversation on conflict is not abuse and the duty of Christian repair. Uh, this is the introductory video for our um, third and final session. You can find two videos earlier on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. I'm grateful for the conversations that we have been having on Zoom about this. We will have our third and final one this Sunday, 10 a.m. You can find a link to that in our Wednesday email, our Friday email, and if you are not um, on those lists or have trouble finding it, please email me at gail at holytrinitychurch.info and we will get you connected. We are continuing to talk uh, about this with conflict is not abuse, overstating harm, community responsibility, and the duty of repair as a starting point. Um, this is a book by Sarah Schulman. It came out a few years ago and um, as I told you in the first session, I thought I was going to read it for like fun, but then it became reading it for Sunday school. Um, we've had a lot to talk about. We still do. Uh, we're going to focus in this third and final session about the duty of repair, obstacles to conversation, and um, make sure you have your Bibles. We'll go through uh, 2 Samuel um, chapter 12, David's conversation with Nathan and um, Isaiah 58. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It is a beautiful vision, um, just affecting phrases, repairer of the breach, restorers of streets to live in, that show God's vision for our, um, our communal flourishing. I'm excited to talk about it with you. Let's get started with some other examples uh, that we might look at when talking about the duty of repair. As you may remember from earlier sessions, uh, here's a recap of Shulman's thesis. She says, my thesis is that at many levels of human interaction, there's the opportunity to conflate discomfort with threat, to mistake internal anxiety for exterior danger, and in turn to escalate rather than resolve. I'll show how this dynamic, rather between, whether between individuals, groups of people, governments and civilians, or between nations is a fundamental opportunity for either tragedy or peace. Conscious awareness of these political and emotional mechanisms gives us all a chance to face ourselves, to achieve recognition and understanding, to avoid escalation towards unnecessary pain. In this final chapter, she talks about um, do what feels right as our um, as like sort of our guiding social maxim for this. Uh, she says it can be a capitulation to controls of impulsivity. It can be rooted in trauma and egged on by bad friends and negative family relationships. Do what feels right. That's not been, that's not been my best guide in the past. And, um, but let me know, let me know if it has been yours. I do think, um, I do think this is where the multiple levels of accountability in Christian community offer anchoring, offer guidance that secular community doesn't have. Um, I think we can argue that there, you can say that there are some attempts at replicating this, um, but we really need, for me, for me, I really need uh, Christ's forgiveness, um, Christ's forgiveness, Christ's judgment to make, um, to make the world make sense and to make this run for me. So instead of do what feels right, she advises casual grace, casual grace. And I think that to me is such a Jesus's earthly ministry phrase, uh, casual grace through personal interactions. Jesus offers healing, miracles, um, a sense of humor and a sense of really seeing people where they are and transforming them um, out of desperate circumstances and back into community. Casual grace. Shulman uh, offers a really vague example. I wish she had gone more in depth with this one. She talks about how identifying the problem doesn't make you the problem. She talks about a disagreement with a click in a city. Please tell us more. <laughs> She doesn't identify it, but she describes it as overwhelming, pointless, and mean. She writes about being raised culturally Jewish, and so she digs into Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, 
and decides she's gonna write everyone a letter to apologize for her part, to apologize for her part, not to demand apology for theirs, but to begin the process, to be the bigger person. Nobody responds. Nobody responds with any dialogue. Nobody responds with a, um, thank you for this. This has, this has led to some reconsideration on my part. It's tremendously disappointing. Nobody responds except for one spokesperson out of a whole group, one spokesperson to say her apology is an admission of her sole fault. Ow. Identifying the problem doesn't make you the problem. Um, this has come up, uh, I think the more, the more we listen for this theme, the more we'll see it. I think, uh, I think one place where I hear it is in conversations about racism. Um, I haven't heard it, uh, I haven't heard it here, but I have heard it in other places and I know, um, I know it comes up, this idea that if you bring it up, if you talk about it, you are the problem. That it's not, there. this idea that um, saying that there is racism in, Amer in American society is racist. Um, and that's such a, uh, that's such a way, that's such a way to end a conversation rather than to um, have a conversation about American history um, and the America we'd like to be talking about racism is racist and you bring it up, you are creating the problem. Um, a plug for the Conversation Project. This is a group that's been meeting uh, twice a month. Get in touch with Bobby Yo. You can find her in the directory app or um, email me. I'll get you connected. This is a group that has been uh, formed to continue our Sunday School conversations on um, the Gospel and Race that began this summer and fall, and this group has really been digging into this with thoughtfulness and faithfulness, and if you're not already connected, they would love to connect with you about this. Another factor Shulman identifies as a barrier to repair is saying that systemic answers don't speak to deep personal pain. She describes a lecture at a university and a student's response to her. Um, the student says, Sarah, so you're saying that when I was 10 years old and my father was beating me, someone should have sat me down and said, and then Shulman describes her as sarcastically mimicking a condescending voice. He only did that because of patriarchy, racism, and poverty. Uh, the student's clearly speaking from um, deep pain and trauma and hurt and felt dismissed. Felt like all of that was dismissed um, by buzzword systemic level answers. Shulman says, I told her directly, softly, in a, in a slow tone of voice, I didn't believe that a person should tell a 10-year-old child who was beaten by her father that what happened to her was caused by racism, patriarchy, and poverty. She then asks the room, how many people thought that's what I said? No one raised their hands. And so she continues, respectfully, kindly underlining that the girl should have been loved and cared for. And what her father did was wrong. She asked, did you feel anxious when I was talking to you? The girl said, yes. The girl said, I, um, I didn't hear you. I misconstrued, I misconstrued what you said. And that shows, uh, that shows to me really, really powerful, really powerful humility. And, uh, you know, on a, 10,000 feet sociological, psychological level, um, I think what Shulman is saying tracks, but it didn't speak to the person's pain. And I think that we see Jesus do that. We may do that in, um, we may do that in Christian community. We hope to do it in pastoral care. Um, so many, I think so many of our problems come from unacknowledged and unseen pain, and we try desperately to have that um, seen, acknowledged, and understood. Um, so I think this, while the student um, was very emotionally up, she hit on something that is, uh, 
is deeply true. When you, when you say the broad systemic level factors, you're not connecting, you're not connecting with the emotional, with the emotional heart of it. The student needed to hear, um, she needed her inner child spoken to before she could hear, um, root causes and generational trauma and social factors. She needed her inner child spoken to, acknowledged to, and this sense of um, deep love and grace found in the gospel. I think she, this is what, this is what that does for us. It speaks to, it speaks to our inner child. Um, but I think this is a really interesting point. If we communicate in buzzwords without emotions acknowledged, we can compound hurt. I read an article on Slate called, It Makes Perfect Sense That QAnon Took Off With Women This Summer. And uh, the author describes the QAnon, um, I think theory gives it too much credit. It's maybe um, hysteria, panic, desperation. Um, And I've read, uh, I'll, I'll share this link with you if, uh, um, if you email me it, I'll, I'll have to find it first. A good friend of mine who is a, uh, InterVarsity, uh, minister really spoke to how to talk to, um, friends and family members sort of caught up in that, um, caught in that conspiracy, caught up in that conspiracy hysteria. And he said, um, you know, invite people to examine inconsistencies, invite people to um, reconsider it. But first of all, hear, hear the pain that made them think this was worth their time and energy in exploring. So this article on Slate talks about how it says um, how we talk about what we talk about affects how the conversation goes. She says, uh, leftist discourse on social media platforms can have a preacherly aspect that asserts moral truth without giving the listener the option of disagreeing. This can strike the not yet persuaded as condescending, bossy, or dismissive of their right to form independent judgments. Q proselytizing folks err in the opposite direction. They tell tantalizing stories about their heartfelt conversions that are extremely light on detail and almost invariably conclude by saying, do your own research. Of course, this has power. It has the frisson of secrecy. Find out what they're not telling you. Most of all, it's flattering. It expresses full faith in the reader's abilities to discover the truth, promises a light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, appears to invite independent verification, free inquiry. But in practice, searching out those hashtags tends to lead people into closed information ecosystems. Closed information ecosystems. And yes, lectures that are every bit as didactic and condescending as any uh, woke explainer. The key is this, the new recruits feel like they have discovered these things. The, um, you get the emotional hit you get the emotional hit of um, that a buzzword or a systemic answer um, doesn't give. But Shulman says it could, it could give this if we began by really hearing people, by really sitting down, listening and saying, you said something harsh, was something else going on for you that day? Um, it sounds simple, but I can think of times when I haven't done it and I have, and I should have. She also goes on to say, oh, and this is so bad and so American. She cites a 2013 Australian study and the study says, this is the study's findings, digging in and refusing to admit an error feels pretty great. An Australian study published in 2013 found that when people refused to acknowledge they had made mistakes, they reaped more psychological benefits than those who copped to their errors. <laughs> the study showed that people who refused to admit wrongdoing felt greater self-esteem, 
and more in control than those who did apologize, even if they were liars, and even if they knew it. Even if they knew it. Let's, let's hear that again. <laughs> Digging in and refusing to admit an error feels pretty great. Ow. That's American. It's American right now. Uh, but I think that need for control, that need for control is really, really astute because I think if you don't have um, God's grace and Christ's redemption to lean on, and to trust, and to trust that even if you're wrong, um, even if you've made a mistake, uh, you don't have to stay in control by doubling down. You can rest in God's forgiveness, rest in um, Christ coming to take your burden away, and rest in a final and ultimate redemption. And if you don't have that, I can really see and hear how staying in control feels better. Digging in and refusing to admit an error feels pretty great. Ouch. Shulman writes about, uh, continues about how repressing information about ourselves or our friends, creating scapegoats as a way to avoid our problems, and using shunning to unite a clique and create group identity, all of this builds on that. It makes people feel better because it makes them feel superior. And she says, cliques, families, nations, if we are in groups that cannot be self-critical and therefore punish difference, we will join in on the shunning, excluding, and cold shouldering. But if we are in groups that promote acceptance, intervene to create communication, and realize that people have contradictions, we will be able to face and deal with the true nature of conflict, that it is participatory. And it cannot be solved by cruel spreading rumors, enacting laws, and incarcerating, invading, and occupying. She talks about two kinds of shunning and offers them both rest. Of course, the person who shuns from a place of supremacy, uh, she says the big man in a provincial town is her example, probably hearkening back to that earlier really vague conflict. I respect her privacy, I admit to my curiosity, uh, is the least likely to risk opening up his mind. She says, but the person who shuns from a place of trauma is the person who benefits most from change because the exhausting cycle of projection has a chance to rest. She says, wouldn't it be amazing if we could turn to our friends and say, I felt anxious and I exaggerated. And instead of using that as a reason to ignore, disparage us or punish us, whenever we say, I feel anxious and so I exaggerated, our friends would put their arms around us, hug us and thank us and praise us for telling the truth. She says, talk and listen. Learn from the art of fiction writing. All people are real. Your actions have consequences on other people. And nothing disrupts dehumanization more than inviting someone over, looking into their eyes, hearing their voice, and listening. All right, so join me on Zoom. We'll talk about David and Nathan's conversation. Uh, we'll talk about Isaiah 58, a beautiful vision of... Uh, the restoration ahead for us and how we can practice our readiness for that in the meantime. Thank you. See you on Zoom on Sunday.